So now I want to turn to space groups because this is so important, determining the space group. If you are handed the space group by the technician who collected your data and you're not able to solve the structure, you really must question whether it was assigned correctly in the first place. And that's why it's nice if you actually have the raw data um, so that you can examine it. If you get stuck, though, you can help, have me help you, Zonkar can help you, other people can help you. So most of the time, the automatic software does a good job. But once in a while, it, it might miss an axial length. Sometimes an axis have, has a pattern of strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, going in one direction. And you might overlook the weak ones, the weak intensities, and think that the axis is shorter than it really is. Things like that. Or you might think it's center symmetric when it's non center symmetric, and so on. Um, you can't really go from symmetric to non center symmetric because in a non center symmetric space group, there's more data. So you've already merged the equivalent reflections and lost half of the data if you do that. So you have to go back to the original data. We'll talk about that next week, anyhow. Okay, so space groups, 230 of them. <laughs> Do you have, all have access to the international tables, like through your library or online? It's International Tables Volume A has all the space groups. No, not A, C. C has all the space groups. Okay, I'll show you a picture of that. Let me just switch that on. So what we'll do today is talk about these two extra operations, which are the ones that actually lead to space groups. Um, some of the directions for symmetry operations. And these two operations are the screw axis and the glide reflections. And I'll refer to the international tables frequently so that maybe you'll be inspired to do the same for yourself. It's, it's interesting to me because when I first started doing crystallography, that was so important that you had those tables. But now the software is so advanced that you almost can get by without them. Um, but often I'll ask my students, you know, so you're working on this structure, what's the space group? And they can't tell me they have never even paid attention to the space group. But th that used to be kind of the most important thing, the space group. All right, so let's go ahead. So these are the two, I like this depiction of the two uh, special symmetry operations. Um, it's again, a screw axis and a glide reflection. So the screw axis involves two-fold rotation plus translation. The order doesn't actually matter. It's commutative. The same thing with the glide reflection. It's translation, but instead of rotation, it's mirror <coughs> reflection. So look, examine these hands here. <laughs> this one is, it starts out here, let's say. And by the way, this symbol is the symbol for two-fold rotation. I'll give you more symbols in a little while. Um, and the plus means it's above this plane that you're seeing. So as you do the two-fold rotation, the hand goes around to the other side, right? And then it moves by a half translation. And down here, you're seeing the same thing again. This is exactly the same because it's actually, it begins in the unit cell below, right? But because of the screw axis, it ends up back in this original unit cell. Okay, then the mirror, again, this is a symbol for the reflection if it's, um, no, this is a symbol for a glide, actually. Um, in this case, it's not turned around, it's just reflected. But it's still a half translation. The screw axis is much easier to understand, though, in practice than the glide. The reason is, well, you'll see in a minute, but um, the way it's depicted in the space group symbol is the key, but it becomes a little complicated because there's more than one way to reflect. Whereas the screw axis is definitive, you know that it goes around this direction. <laughs> okay. So try to keep that picture in your mind is what's going on. Now it doesn't matter where you begin, it depends on where the, uh, this particular operation is defined in the space group. It could be along a direction like that but it could begin, say, here in the middle instead. So that's why you need to learn how to use the tables. OK, so the notation for the screw axis is N subscript M. It doesn't have to be actually a uh, 
twofold. It can be any other thing. It could be a threefold, for example. Um, so like a three sub one refers to a threefold rotation and then a translation of uh, one third. Got that? N over M? Or, yeah, M over N. OK, it's written here. 3 sub 2 is basically the same thing. It's just, it's, it's like a, when you have a helix that's a left-handed helix or a right-handed helix. It's just starting out going the other direction. But the end result is, is a chiral difference. One of them is going one way and the other one's going this way. Okay. So in an uh, in antiomorphic space group, you're likely to encounter uh, 3 sub 1 or 3 sub 2. And which one you choose to begin is you don't necessarily know because you need to know the hand in this to know which one is correct. So you have to consider both. Okay. So the glide reflection now, or sometimes called glide planes, people go back and forth on these names. Um, it's going to have a letter, and the, the letter refers to which unit cell direction you're translating. But the position in the space group symbol tells you which direction, which plane you reflect through. So I'll give you an example of that. So look at this. Example, an A glide means translate, translate by one half along the A direction and then reflect. But you can either reflect through AC or AB. Okay. So this gives, in terms of equivalent positions, and I use these equivalent positions all the time, that's also something that comes out in space groups a lot. So you start out at XYZ, just some arbitrary XYZ. You end up at a half plus X minus Y and Z. And you should realize, too, that you can always add or subtract one or two or anything to get to another unit cell, like something like X plus a half. Y minus one and Z is absolutely equivalent. You just added a one, so you slid over to the next unit cell over in the Y direction. OK. But because of this ambiguity, you have to kind of pay attention to the space group symbol. And then some glides are not actually A, B, or C. They're called N glides. So they take a diagonal direction, A plus B over 2, for example. To understand these, it really does help to look at the tables. And then there's a diamond glide, which you only have to see in a cubic space group. And it's actually. Uh, diagonal and then divided by four, so it's a one-fourth translation instead of one-half. <clears throat> and similarly, you can go different directions. And those are called diamond glides. I just call these, these other ones N-glides. <laughs> I don't know if they have another name. Uh, anyway, but diamond glides are called those. Okay. So let's look at this space group name. Conventions. This is the key to understanding what's going on. The, there's actually four sort of slots. I think about them as, as slots. The first one refers to the lattice type. So you can have P, you can have C, you can have I, you can have F. Those are the C can also be A or B. So in the first, uh, the symmetry operation, this, this, is, this is an orthorhombic space group. It's P2121, it's chiral. It has three uh, screw axes along each of the three directions. It's a fairly common space group, actually. Um, so the symmetry operation of screw axis is along A, and also along B, and also along C. This way. Um, so this, remember, we had seven Brave lattices. So there's, this, this could be different. and then. Sometimes there's uh, ambiguity and re redundancy in the symbol, and so there are symbols that are considered to be uh, the correct ones just by convention. So here's some examples. Uh, triclinic, the only thing that you can have in a triclinic space group is either nothing or you can have a center of inversion. Center of inversion inverts x, y, z to minus x, minus y, minus z. So don't worry about direction. It doesn't matter. It just goes through wherever that center is. Um, 
monoclinic. The only lattice types in monoclinic are primitive and N-centered. The C can, again, it can be either A or it can also be I in this case. Um, but the unique axis is always B, remember that. And sometimes you'll see the space group specified with sort of a placeholder in the, the uh, positions which you don't need. So for example, the space group P2, the 2 is a again a, a rotation by 180 degrees along the B direct, around the B axis. Uh, because that's the unique one. But sometimes it's written as P121 because there's nothing happening along A or C. So this is, in the space group tables, uh, all the uh, space groups have numbers, starting with the simplest, so P1, number one, and P1 bar, number two. And those are the only two triclinic ones. Uh, you get to monoclinic, there's a lot more. I'll come to that in a minute. Tetragonal, there's so many. <laughs> and yeah, fortunately, we don't have to deal with those too often. Uh, and I explained this yesterday that you just do not get the lattice if you try to put that twofold axis around the A direction or the C direction. It just doesn't work. And also by convention, uh, beta is chosen to be obtuse, in other words, greater than 90 degrees, although it wouldn't fail if it was designated as less than 90 degrees because obviously they're basically the same, but just by convention it's usually greater than 90. Okay, so here's the rest of the monoclinic ones. Um, this is kind of a useful little piece of information, I think. So 34.5% of all small molecule crystal structures that occur in the Cambridge Structural Database, which probably you've seen. Um, if not, I'll talk about it later. So number 14, P to 1 over C. That's an awful lot. Why that is not really clear to me. People have attempted to explain that, but there's really no easy way to explain why it's so common. It, it seems to produce an efficient packing case, but why is that um, interesting? Now, P21 over C, sometimes people use P21 over A, especially in the older literature, you might see P21 over A, because that was before they set the standard that P21 over C was preferred. So if you want to make a comparison between your structure, which is in P21 over C, and their structure, which was in P21 over A, uh, simple transformation matrices will do the job for you. It's not too difficult, and mostly your software will also help you in that regard. I'm not going to go into matrix algebra in this course just because it's a whole other subject, and I think you've all taken advanced math classes. You know how to do matrices, right? <laughs> okay, and then the next most prevalent, 8.4% is C2 over C. Um, so this is a centered lattice, number 15, centrosymmetric, also very common. But the first common non centrosymmetric one, or actually chiral one, is P21. And that's loved by the protein crystallographers. The others, uh, I have seen all of those from time to time. But they're all like less than 1% uh, occurrence. So they're really uncommon. But say, if you had. I have had a case or two where uh, I had P2 over C and it turned out it was actually PC or vice versa because they're really not too different. All you're doing is eliminating the inversion there. Uh, they both have a glide, but this one has no inversion. It's non centrosymmetric But it is not chiral. Why? If there's a mirror, it can't be chiral. And a glide involves a mirror. So anytime you see a letter A, B, or C, it's got to be, at the very least, it has to be uh, a chiral, not chiral. OK, then going to orthorhombic, uh, there's all of these between numbers 16 and 74. So I'm not going to go through all of them, of course. But these are the most prevalent. Uh, P2121, again, is chiral. 
we just mentioned, that one has three um, perpendicular screw axes. Pretty common, 7.2%. PBCA, also very common, so it has three glides. The, so this is like a B glide um, where the translation is along the B direction. B means that. But which inversion do you choose? So you invert through the BC plane. It's in the first position, so you invert through BC. This is translate along C, invert through AC. Confused yet? <laughs> OK. PNA21, pretty common also, actually, all of these. I mean, you do 100 structures, you probably find these somewhere along the way. It's funny, you know, when I first started doing crystallography, which was in about 1975, PhD thesis might have three, four structures in it. Nowadays, my students often end up with 300. <laughs> so it has changed a great deal. But what took me three months to do, my first structure, I would do today in maybe a couple hours. So computers have just changed everything so much. It's, it's incredible. And actually, you can probably usually get the result. If you're sitting at the diffractometer, you have the instrument in front of you, you can work up the data even while it's collecting. And after you have maybe a third or a half of the data finished, you can solve it right there. It might take 20 minutes, so it's just so fast. OK. Tetragonal uh, only lattices are P and I. And it's, now it's different. The organization of the symmetries in the space group symbol start out with the C axis, which is often the longest axis in tetragonal. <coughs> and then um, A and B are equal in tetragonal, so whatever is happening along A is also happening along B. And in the third position, it's not along any axes, it's along the 110 direction, remember, which is the diagonal between A and B. 110 is the, that direction. So that's a little tricky when you get to tetragonal. And again, there's so many space groups, 68 space groups. <clears throat> the most common, I for 1 over A. And even there, it's less than 1%. These are both chiral and actually are related to one another because force of one screw can be also a force of three screw. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This, they aren't related because this is 2, 1, and this is 2. There is another space group that's force of three. 2, 1, 2, 1. And it is just the enantiomer, essentially the enantiomeric space group to this one. And similarly here, this could be P4 sub 1, 2 sub 1, 2. Okay. I'm not going to go any further into the hexagonal and trigonal and cubic. You won't encounter those often, I don't think. Um, and you know, to go through them here would just be a little bit tricky. But it, when you get to hexagonal and trigonal, if you use the hexagonal setting, it's kind of similar to this, where the c-axis is limited, is listed first, and then a and b is second. And actually, I forget what the next one is. OK, so these international tables for crystallography, well, I think it might not be volume. Is it volume a? Let me look. OK, there's all these different volumes. Um, some of them are just strictly protein. I guess volume A is limited with space groups. And uh, I have an online version of that now through our library. <clears throat> so I don't have to lug around this big fat book. This uh, volume C has a lot of tabulated information, like the absorption values for different elements and all kinds of tables. Actually, you don't really need most of the rest of them very often. <laughs> a is the key. And it was started a long time ago with, um, I think, Kathleen Lonsdale, who's attributed with getting the first crystal structure of benzene. Very, very famous female crystallographer from way back. I think she began the international tables. They're revised frequently. I think the last revision was last year. There are a few changes, but the fundamental stuff hasn't changed much. OK, let's look at some of their conventions in the international tables. Um, the two-fold rotation axis I sketched for you, 
yesterday. I don't know if you remember, but it looks like this. But if it's a screw axis, you add these little squiggles here, top and the bottom, if it's a two-fold screw axis. Um, these are kind of intuitive in a way. I mean, a three-fold rotation, you start out with this triangle. This is now you know, looking down on the uh, rotation axis. It's coming out toward you. So these are the symmetry axes normal to the plane of projection in this table. Then there's more if you're looking you know, in the plane of projection. <laughs> so normal to the plane of projection. Um, and it, it goes down, you know, fourfold rotation axis with the center of symmetry is this sort of diamond shaped thing with an open circle in the middle. So, you know, and here it is that's without inversion. Here's a, a one with the screw axis, three, three sub one or three sub two. Three sub one and three sub two actually denoted by different directions of the little squiggle. So uh, you, you're not gonna memorize all of these, although some of them are pretty intuitive and you might want to consult the international tables. What is it saying over here? The, uh, not that exciting. <laughs> Okay, here are the ones that are normal to the plane of projection. Again, I have a hard time remembering these, but this, this, this one isn't too hard to remember. Just a straight line with no dashes or anything as a mirror. And then the glides, again, get confusing. Sometimes dashes, sometimes dots. Um, you have to stare at them for a while. The um, screw axis, I pointed to that before, though, is pretty good along in the normal, uh, perpendicular to the normal two-fold rotation. It's just that the arrow has, you know, feathers on both sides instead of just one side. Okay, so let's look at the tables. Now, um, this is P1 bar, so number two, pretty simple, just try clinic. Um, all of the tables have essentially the same organization. Remember we already talked yesterday about point groups, so the point group is listed up here. But it also gives you the old Schoenflase symbol, so that's kind of nice. Um, Patterson symbol symmetry is given here, which is we ha something we haven't discussed yet, but I'll briefly discuss next week. Um, let's see. So HM stands for Herman Mogan. That's okay. That's most of the top information. Now these three here are sketches of where the symmetry operations occur with three different projections. The first projection is always down AC. I think. Or maybe it depends on the space group, I guess. But you can tell from here, this is AB, sorry. It's a little small. Notice that these, these little circles are the inversion centers. <coughs> you don't have to have it at the origin. <coughs> these are essentially all related by you know, being at the edge, at the corner, but then there's also one in the middle. Does it matter where you put your molecule? No, not does it matter. You can start with it here, you can start with it here, you can start with it here and then decide, well, I'd like, okay, my molecule has a center of inversion, I'd rather see it in the middle of the unit cell. So all you have to do is just move it by a half, a half, a half, and you're in the middle. And sometimes that makes a prettier picture, especially if you want to show the axes in your drawing. Um, some people don't even pay any attention to that, and they can be working with their structure way over in another unit cell that's you know three, three, three away from the where you are. Here. But that's not recommended. It's better to kind of stick within the beginning unit cell. Okay, so the different. It's so simple in triclinic because each corner has a center of inversion, and there's one in the middle. Okay, then this picture is telling you about the symmetry operations and what happens when you actually carry those out. Um, so you start with an arbitrary position. Usually they start with a circle plus, so that's the arbitrary position. Since there's a center of inversion here, when you apply the inversion, it goes below, right? And it changes hand, so this gets a minus and a uh, comma in the middle, and the same all around. 
So this one's pretty easy to understand, I think. But you can imagine that they do get kind of complicated. Now, um, the origin is also arbitrary, as I explained before. It doesn't matter whether you have um, an atom at your corner or no atom. It's just that the repeat is the repeat. But or, usually they, they choose the origin at one, <coughs> or at one bar, where there is an inversion. And this, the asymmetric unit, is also of, of a lot of interest because it's telling you um, what's the minimum amount of this unit cell that you need to describe the whole thing. And actually, it's just a half of that space because the other half is always generated by inversion. So the asymmetric unit is, is smaller. Uh, you can ca count it as this, between 0 and a half, 0 and 1. What does it say? 0 and 1. Yeah. But that's also arbitrary. I mean, it could be 0 to 1, 0 to a half, and 0 to 1. Any questions about this so far? This one's pretty easy. Um, I challenge you to do a cubic one now. <laughs> OK. There's a second page. The second page is also extremely interesting. <clears throat> Um, the positions. Um, in this case, the positions are these listed, which you saw in the previous picture. You know, there's, there's this one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of them. And so they've listed nine here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, the first one, I guess, is, oh no, there's only eight. Wait. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, okay. And these H's, they're called Wyckoff letters. First time I used that in a paper, I misspelled Wyckoff. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> so uh, multiplicity means how, how often it appears. And the, um, oh, OK, I know. So what it's saying is if you have something at a totally general position, not on an inversion center, it's listed as x, y, z. And then this, because it's minus x minus y minus z, generates a second molecule. So the number, uh, the multiplicity, in other words, of, of repetitions of that is 2. However, then you have these other positions, which if something resides exactly on that position, you don't get the repetition. So you can't invert something at a half, a half, a half. If it's exactly at a half, a half, a half. So we call that a special position. Okay. Um, don't worry too much about this down here unless you get into some really hairy fundamental crystallography. But over here, the reflection conditions, I've circled it because it's very important. When you're looking at your data, which is basically a list of HKLs, um, sometimes you see that there are what we call systematic absences. And these systematic absences are really the key to determining the space group. In P1 bar, there are no conditions, so you don't have any systematic absences at all. So the amb only ambiguity here is, det if you know that it's triclinic, is determining whether it has a center of inversion or not. And it's, the conditions aren't telling you anything. Some space groups are uniquely determined by the special positions, though. Others are not. I think I have a table somewhere that shows that. OK, then I'll just look at P21 over C, since that's the most common space group. So you remember what these are? It's screw axis, right, a two, 2 sub 1. And this is the AC plane in this first drawing. Yeah, that's why it was confused. So we're looking now down the direction of the rotation. And you know it, it already is getting more complicated, because these are not at the corners. <laughs> this one is at a quarter along C, and this one is at a half along A. And from a different perspective, the di this direction of the, of the uh, translation is this way, along B, as it must be. And the, again, the, here we have the screw axes that are not in the normal to the plane, but in the plane. And this is, a, again, a description of what happens to a, something at an arbitrary position. And if you study it for a while, you'll understand it. I, I don't really want to go through it, but 
it's uh, this is where your, your molecules would sit. If you start out with the molecule here and you decide you don't want it there, any of those equivalent positions are good. The equivalent positions are listed on the next slide. So there's four equivalent positions within the unit cell. So if you have a general position, x, y, z, then you have these other three and they are equivalent. Literally they are equivalent. So you could move your molecule anywhere you want, but if you have other things in the unit cell, they have to also be moved at the same time. Okay. Then there's, there's four different sets of special positions, and this is the kind of symmetry operation at that special position. So only the inversion creates a special position. The screw axis doesn't create a special position. So those are, again, you know, you can, you can see where they are. There's one right here. So it's, this is A, this is C. So that one is at a half, zero, zero because B is up, and zero, yeah, half, zero, zero. So where is it? Here, this one. So that, if you're using that one, that's Wyckoff position, letter B, um, there's only two of them in the unit cell if something sits there. And, uh, yeah. Now the reflection conditions get a lot more complicated. Um, general is probably the most important one. Special is something that you might see <coughs> if, let's say you had a crystal structure with one very heavy atom, like a mercury and everything else was very light might give a sort of feeling that there are these uh, conditions, but they're not actually derived directly from the space group. Well, they are, but, you know, they, they, all they could do is cause confusion. These are the basic ones. Um, zero K zero is the one that arises directly from the two-fold screw. H zero L arises from the glide which is uh, it's a C glide. And in the, this case, what this means is that you would probably see a repetition of look at, looking along the H0L direction that L is only intense if it's even. The 2N means even. But that's not a necessary thing. Um, you, the necessary thing is that L cannot be odd and have a, a strong intensity. So sometimes this, this same set of conditions is written as L is equal to 2n plus 1, meaning that that represents an absence. Okay. But the International Tables uses a, this convention. Um, so it, this is a, a space group that's uniquely determined by these conditions. Um, 00L is actually just a subset of this one, if you look at it, right? If this is true, then this is also true. So it's really only the first two that are important. Those are worth memorizing because you're going to see P21 over C a lot. Now, OK, again, we have these general positions. So also remember that there's four general positions in P21 over C. It's a good thing to remember. Questions about that? I have I haven't gotten an answer yet from Sankar about whether I can just give you the PowerPoint PDFs. If not, then I can just email you some of these tables. Uh, probably we can give you the PDFs. I just haven't heard for sure. Okay, this was <laughs> okay. So this was just an example of mistakes. Um, I liked it because it came from a pretty good journal, Nature Communications. Um, the authors, you probably can't read it, it's pretty small. <clears throat> they had to retract their structure because they had determined the space group later to be P2, it writes, they've written it as P21, but it's really P2 sub 1. Um, but they had solved it in P1. A lot of software solves structures in P1. That's just uh, because in P1 you don't have any constraints or anything, you just look for the structure. <clears throat> But that wasn't the end of the story, and so they should have actually changed it. And um, 
Though you can't really read this very well. Our value is mm, not great, 7% in the correct space group. And it's a little bit higher, 9 something percent in the incorrect space group. Um, both P1 and P21 are chiral. So this is a chiral structure. It's kind of a neat structure. But this wasn't too long ago. And kind of embarrassing if you do that. <laughs> OK. So it's, it's interesting that before modern software became available, people often made mistakes. Um, there was a crystallographer at Caltech. His name was uh, Dick Marsh. Have you heard of him at all? And he, he made a, a career out of finding mistakes. <laughs> so he published quite a few papers on errors that people had made. Extremely embarrassing. And if he caught you, you said to be marshed. <laughs> I actually did get marshed once. It wasn't a space group error, but I had called something uh, dinitrogen, which was actually a dichloromethane. Very bad. But um, it seems that even now, about 1% appear to have been determined in the wrong space group. And they're, what are they missing are inversion centers. So the most common error actually is the assignment of CC, which is a monoclinic space group, when it should be C2 over C. And I know why that happens, because I've personally solved structures in CC, and they solved easily. But in fact, they should have been in C2 over C, and you have to figure out how to instead do it in C2 over C. Now, there's some. A lot of checking software right now. The one I like the best is, is by Ton Speck. He's in the Netherlands, and he's written a program called Playton. Have, you, has, have any of you ever used Playton? OK, so he'll tell you, usually, if he suspects that you have the space group wrong. He'll give you something like 82% uh, agreement that it should be different. If it's more than a 90% suspicion that it should be different, he's right. <laughs> But more than that, he'll even transform it for you. So you don't even have to do the matrices or anything. Um, so hopefully, maybe by the last day, we can talk about that software a little bit. It's excellent. There's so much in it. OK. So I'm coming back again to this idea that the precision of the structure isn't only based on the R value. It's based on the data to parameter ratio. And if you're doing the wrong space group, you have too few data, usually. So your structure isn't as good, either. Besides which, it'll look funny. I'll give you some examples of that. Our value will be high. It won't converge easily. There's a lot of signs. OK, so Lowry groups. Um, if you are doing an absorption correction, for example, which you may or may not be doing, because maybe the technician's doing it for you, you do need to be aware of the Lowry group. So the Lowry group refers to the point symmetry of the HKLs themselves. So I already mentioned <coughs> Friedel's law, which assumes that any HKL, uh, let me just write it, at all, you know, like let's just say 2, 3, minus 2, in the intensity of that is exactly the same as the intensity of minus 2, minus 3, 2. In other words, it's centrosymmetric. This was this is Friedel's law. When can that break down? When you have anomalous dispersion, mostly, uh, which is due to chirality and to some extent to whether or not it's centrosymmetric. Um, so the Lowry the Lowry group for just say monoclinic. And assuming that Friedel's law is obeyed, the Lowry group is 2 over m. What does that mean? That means if you have HKL again, and I'm, let me just write it without writing on the i, but I'm referring to the intensity here. Um, that would mean you have, say, 2, 3, minus 2 is equal to, OK, let's do, it doesn't matter whether you do the mirror first or the rotation first. I'll do the rotation first. So that's going to give you minus 2. 3, 
2. So I'm changing the sign of x and z. Right, that's what you would do if you rotate it around the b direction. Are you with me? And then if I now do the mirror, that's equal to minus 2, minus 3, 2, which is equal to 2, minus 3, minus 2. Those four different ones, right? So this is going from here to here is twofold. And then going from here to here is this one, the mirror. And from here to here is a mirror. So this set of four reflections has two over m symmetry. So that's the Lowy symmetry. However, now, if you, let's say it's not monoclinic um, 2 over m. It's one of the other monoclinic space groups, like just 2. Let's go over here. And it's, it's a chiral space group. So if it's strongly diffracting, you will notice that Friedel's law breaks down. And so you don't have those same equivalents anymore. All you have is you've lost the center of symmetry. So you would only have the first two, let's say, 2, 3, minus 2 equals minus 2, 3, 2. And those are inequivalent to the other ones that you would expect. So the highest symmetry for monoclinic is 2 over m, but you could have lower. So what's the important point is that if you're doing absorption correction, which depends on the, having the equivalence <coughs> of lots of reflections. Um, so you can kind of erase the effects of the x-rays coming in from a different direction in your crystal. This is called the, the multi-scan effect. Um, you need to tell the absorption program that the Lowy symmetry is lower than 2 over m if, in fact, it's p2. And you don't always know that at the beginning. So maybe you need to go back and repeat the absorption correction. And if it actually is chiral, and if you really care about the chirality, it will only be correct if you go back and correct the Lowy symmetry. Unfortunately, the technicians don't understand that, and so they may pass it off to you without making that um, thing. And so you may think it's racemic when it really isn't. So usually it shows up anyway. OK, I don't want to scare you too much. <laughs> OK, so there's 11 Lowy groups. I have them on another slide for you. Uh, the same as the number of central symmetric space groups. And if Friedel's law, Friedel's law is obeyed. And if you collect too much data, there's no da da damage done because you just have more redundancy. And so you average the ones that are equivalent, which actually improves the accuracy of your measurements. Okay. So redundancy means more information than the minimum. Um, so like I already mentioned, triclinics, uh, actually you only need half because the intensity of HKL is equal to the intensity of minus H minus K minus L. So if you go on and look at the other um, fractions that you would have in the different Lowy groups, going from, again, this is assuming Friedel's law here, monoclinic, the Lowy groups 2 over M, and you only need 1 fourth because of the equivalences, right? Jump all the way down to cubic. Um, there's two Lowy groups. And only 1 48th of reciprocal space is needed in this Lowy group. <laughs> this was very important during a period of time when data was collected using a point detector, not an area detector, but just a point detector, like this. You know, X-rays just going through one at a time. Uh, Usually, you didn't want to collect too much redundancy because it took weeks <laughs> using a point detector. Area detectors are so much faster. And redundancy is cheap, so you might as well use a redundancy. But we didn't want to use it when we had point detectors. So these are the fractions that are unique in the different Lowy groups. Now let's look at, uh, I already did that. OK. Is that the end of that? Yeah. Let's look at the next. I hope I didn't cut that off too soon. Hold on a sec. How are we doing here for time? OK, a few more minutes. This the next lecture is kind of long, so I'm going to dive into that one.
Okay, so as I've been saying, the intensities are really important in the different space groups. And I'm going to give you some examples of that. But first of all, let's look at sodium chloride again. Cubic. Okay, this is really simple. Um, there's going to be some more math here, too. I apologize for that. Remember back when we were showing Bragg's Law and all that, we talked about things that scattered in phase with one another to give constructive interference. So that's the simple thing when you just have one thing there. But if you have two things there, like sodium and chloride, and they're not on top of each other, they don't scatter in phase. So the, that's the trick in solving a crystal structure, essentially, is figuring out that phase difference, which is totally related to where they are, the two atoms. Um, so we here I just assume sodium is blue and chlorine is red. Chlorine's a little bit bigger than sodium in the sense of having more electrons. And when if, if it's scattering on top of the scattering due to the sodium, then there's going to be some uh, improvement in the intensity. But if it's interfering by being out of phase, then there'll be loss of intensity. So we call this a phase shift. And so you not only have to look at the shift, but also the intensity. So the intensity related to the number of electrons, but the total intensity or amplitude has to do with the sum of the two in this case. And this is such a simple case. That's why Bragg was able to figure this one out. OK. so. Now a little math, sorry about that. Um, the phase shift for chlorine, you can write it this way. So it depends on the HKL, which is, are, are your data, and then it depends on the positions. X for the chlorine, Y for the chlorine, Z for the chlorine. Whoop, didn't subscript those. Um, so that's the shift. And then there's another um, important thing, which is the scattering factor, which is also called the form factor and depends on the uh, phase shift, and which is incorporated here, and also the U value, which is the temperature factor. OK. This is just Bragg's law. So this, this, is, this part of it is the scattering factor. I'll show you a, a sketch of that in a minute. Oh, I know. I wanted to show you, and I, I thought I had it here in the previous slide. <clears throat> Maybe it's here. So for the overall structure, you're going to add up all of these contributions as you proceed through solving the structure, getting what we call FCF calc. So that's the calculated structure factor. And all along, you're comparing that to the observed structure factor, which is, which is your data. So this is the equation to get the structure factor. It's the sum over um, all of the atom positions, x, y, and z, for the ith atom. And there's actually a real part and an imaginary part to it. The um, early crystal structures that were solved were all centrosymmetric because they couldn't deal with the imaginary part. So centrosymmetric uh, structures do not have the imaginary parts. Much, much easier mathematically. Um, the calculated structure factor, oops, hmm. I think I wanted that to be, oh, there. The observed structure factor is the square root of the, um, well, I didn't, yeah, OK. Yeah. Observed is the square root of the intensity of the HKL. That should be an O for observed. OK, the temperature factor is also interesting. We doing time-wise. So you got to keep in mind that the, um, the electrons aren't necessarily spherically s surrounding the nucleus. And when we think of a bond distance, we think of internuclear distances, right? So this is a little deceptive because X-rays are scattered by electrons. Um, and then there's thermal motion, which has to do with just normal vibrations. But that's going to spread out the uh, electrons, too because the atoms are, are moving, and so the electrons are moving with them. 
So you have two effects. You have bonding effects, you know, like, um, you know, D and F electrons that aren't surrounding their atoms sphery spherically, P electrons too. And then you have the, the thermal effects. So usually when you begin a structure, you just assume it's spherical even though it isn't in reality. And early structures didn't even go any further than that. That was all they could deal with computationally. So they were assumed to be spherical thermal parameters. But this is, um, the thermal parameter is something I absolutely keep an eye on as I'm solving a structure. Because sometimes it blows up and that's telling you you did something wrong. Okay, <laughs> we'll go through that later. So this is, this is what the scattering factors look like. Um, this is a plot of, of number of electrons and sine theta over lambda. So the scattering decreases as you increase um, theta, which is the diffraction angle. So as you go out to higher and hang higher angles, your resolution is lower, and the uh, amount of scattering that you get is lower, too. That's what's causing it, essentially. So this is just a plot for hydrogen, carbon, and fluorine. But you get similar plots for all of the elements. Um, one of the things I want you to notice, though, is that hydrogen really cuts off pretty early, goes down basically to zero at a sine theta over lambda around 0.6, um, which is about um, 50 degrees in 2 theta, if it's molybdenum radiation. See, it depends on the radiation, too. So people say, oh, you can't find hydrogens, but actually, <laughs> You can nowadays find hydrogens. Don't believe them. And one way that you can sneakily find them is to actually cut the data to very low resolution, and it shows up better than at high, high resolution. Sometimes, not always. That's a little trick. But every element's different, and these, these scattering factors are actually uh, in, embedded in the program. The program has a library of all the scattering factors. So all you have to do is name the element and it automatically brings up this table. And this is, of course, a function. So you can have the long form or the short form of the function. Short form is just the element name. OK, hydrogens again. Um, it is inaccurate if you look at them, because, of course, the hydrogen's going to, the electron density is going to be pulled towards its parent atom, right? It is, it, it's pretty bare, but it has some electrons, but a lot of them are in the internuclear space between itself and the atom that it's bonded to. So what, the result of that is that the distances are too short that you get by x-ray. Like a, a typical value might be a CH distance of 0.96 angstroms with x-ray radiation, and everybody knows that that isn't real because if you use neutrons, it's more like 1.09 angstroms. So the internuclear distance is much longer. But still, the fact that you can see it at 0.96 angstroms, I believe it's there. It's, that's no problem for me. Um, the other thing that's happening, again, is this thermal motion. And they're light, so they move quite easily. That also kind of reduces their, your ability to spot them. Um, and then there's this other thing that is often quoted, that it's anharmonic stretching vibration. But to get away from this problem, you can go to lower and lower and lower temperatures. And actually, I have some data that I can show you where if you go to helium temperatures, the values that you get are very similar to what you get with neutron diffraction. So you're just cutting out that thermal motion at low temperatures. Helium's expensive, though, so you don't do it. Well, so are neutrons. <laughs> um, OK. So the observed structure factors are square roots of observed experimental intensities. And the calculated structure factor depends on your structure, how much of it you have. If, if your structure is finished, you've found all the atoms, you've refined them, and they're, and they're happy in their places, um, you've got your structure. OK. Oh, OK. So this is, this is a description of how you get systematic absences. So this is a case of just the lattice itself giving systematic absences, which it does, too. I didn't mention that before. So here's the calculated structure factor. And here's the definition. OK. So now this I refers to, say, a particular scattering atom. Um, if, you, if it is at. Um, zero, 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 
then you have this term for the cosine. There would be another one, because of the lattice being a C lattice, it's also at a half, a half, zero. So these are the two cosine terms, okay? And it's centrosymmetric. This actually drops out. And if you just do the math, you end up with this. So if h plus k is odd, then this is going to give you um, a minus 1 here. You have to do the math. Believe me, though, the calculated structure factor um, for an odd h plus k is 0. It's, it's, it was in the uh, tables. So that's how you know the systematic absence. This is just a mathematical thing. I think I have a table here. OK, yeah. So just the lattice itself causes systematic absences. P lattice doesn't cause it cause any. But if it's a C lattice, H plus K equals even. If it's an A lattice, K plus L is even, and so on. I lattice, H plus K plus L is even. So you have to sum all three to see that it's even. And then, again, primitive, no restrictions. Now, the funny thing is that I had thought that I had another table in there earlier. So let me go back and see if I can find that again. Yeah, I think, well, this is one of them. Um, I like this table a lot because sometimes I don't remember the allowing groups. <coughs> so I thought I had this one in the slide, but hopefully you can see it. So these uh, heavy lines here are separating <coughs> the different crystal systems, and the allowing groups that are possible within each of those systems are given here. So again, like monoclinic can be 2, can be m, or can be 2 over m so on. And again, when in the absorption correction programs, you need to know these possibilities. If you don't know what it is yet and you haven't solved the structure yet, you can just pick <coughs> the highest symmetry and then deal with it later if, if necessary. <coughs> I think before we do um, the rest of that particular presentation, we should take a break. And I'm going to see I omitted another table that I wanted to show you. And we'll continue with um, the space groups, determining the space groups and the intensities in the afternoon. OK? All right. Thanks for your attention. Come on up and ask me if you have any questions. Some of these tables are, are really good. And if you don't have access to the international tables, I should send them to you, for sure. <coughs>